Midwest Whitetail is brought to you by Realtree, Hoyt Archery, Muddy Outdoors, Fuse Accessories, Frigid Forage, Trophy Rock, Scott Archery, Cabela's, Rocket Broadheads, Execute Scent Control, Bloodsport Arrows, Redneck Hunting Blinds, Scent Master, Yeti Coolers, Quiet Cat, Non-Typical Wildlife Solutions, Deer Grow, Icon Cameras, and Nikon. Welcome to Midwest Whitetail. On today's episode, I'm going to do a little bit of shooting. We are going to uh, go out and look at one of the micro plots that we're going to be building this spring and give you a few ideas on some that you might work on in the area where you hunt and also some of the strategy behind the location for this one. So we're going to cover some ground today uh, and, and uh, you know, do some shooting. And first, though, I want to talk about a, uh, this is a campaign or an initiative that Cabela's has got going on uh, right at this time. It's called the My Disconnect Day. It's a really cool idea. I'm an old school uh, outdoorsman, I guess, and I'm not real fond of all the devices. Uh, I've been resistant to that whole process of carrying my phone or, you know, even this last season I was carrying my iPad with me quite a bit and doing work from the blind. You know, that, that kind of gets under my skin. So I do like the, the whole concept of this program where they're encouraging everybody to pick a day when they completely unplug. Separate yourself from any of the devices that you're so used to carrying around and looking at all the time. Getting outdoors and, and uh, really being involved in some of the passions that you know we're starting to slowly but surely uh, lose our connection with. So we're going to disconnect uh, from the devices and we're going to reconnect with the outdoors. So go to mydisconnectday.com and learn some more uh, details about this. You can pick your day, you can make a pledge, uh, you can see some really cool ideas from Cabela's on what you can do during your disconnect day. If you've got a Cabela's retailer near you, you can stop in the store and you can get one of these little kits where it's got the pledge card on it and a little uh, paracord bracelet that will help you to remember uh, to you know, disconnect on that day that you've picked. So anyway, uh, take advantage of this, mydisconnectday.com. So let's get to doing some shooting here. I'm only going to cover two tips today because there's, there's so much we can get into with shooting. Last week, I talked about the importance of creating a surprise release by shortening your release, uh, the stem of your release aid, so that you're contacting your index finger, uh, assuming you're shooting an index finger, finger release, uh, further into the finger, and not out, not out on the end where you've got so much uh, kind of dexterity where you can manipulate that trigger a lot more. So I'm going to talk about the surprise release process and why it's so important, and then you know some of the problems that people have when they start doing this. Uh, first thing is just talking about executing it uh, and, and why. Uh, the why is pretty simple. You don't really have to think your way through the shot. You just have to execute the steps. If you issue a now command uh, during the shot, there's a lot more thinking that has to take place. You have to time something. There's got to be you know, the, the pieces of the machine have to fit together pretty well in order to pull that off. And what I find during the moment of truth is the machine isn't really functioning like it should. There's a lot of gears that are, you know, grinding together that that, uh, that that might not do that in the backyard. So on game, I tend to be a little bit rougher uh, if I'm not triggering it by surprise. If I'm commanding the trigger, uh, I tend to, to uh, punch the trigger. I tend to get real hasty. Sometimes I'm not really settled in. I've made bad shots over the years. Just poor execution. And uh, I had a great tip. Oh, it goes back a few years from Pete Shepley at PSE uh, at the ATA show one year. And he said, just make every shot a surprise release. doesn't matter how far or how close the animal is. It could be five yards away walking past your stand. Use the same exact execution that you would use if it was a long shot for, you know, a, a lot more challenging situation. And he said that ingrains in you uh, this whole style of, of, of releasing the string, which... I found uh, eliminates some of those stupid mistakes that I make during the moment of truth. So all I do is I'm at full draw, I'm aiming and squeezing, aiming and squeezing, aiming and squeezing. There's not any, uh, there's no timing involved. And that's just, like I said, it's so much more uh, effective for me when I've got game in front of me than trying to manage all these extra decisions and extra variables. 
So that's why uh, the how, everybody's gonna approach this a little bit differently. Uh, the best way to learn how to do it is to get some kind of a training aid. And I've done segments before on Midwest Whitetail where I've used the, uh, I think it was a Scott Longhorn Hex. It's a back tension release. It doesn't have a trigger on it. You pull it back and all you do is just, you kind of ro roll your hand back, uh, rotate your, your hand as you're drawing through the shot. And uh, that forces you to make a surprise release because it doesn't have a trigger. You don't know when it's gonna go off. So I would really recommend that if you're struggling with this, which almost everybody will, if they've never done it before, uh, that you pick up the something like the Scott Longhorn Hex and uh, force yourself to learn how to make a surprise release. Your nervous system has to get reprogrammed in order for this to work. And you, when you first start, you're going to be um, maybe really startled when the bow goes off. You might even blink or flinch. But as time goes by and you get more and more comfortable with re this release style, you won't be startled anymore. You'll just be surprised, which is what it's supposed to do. You know, the shot will go, you won't blink, you won't flinch, the arrow's just going to go right straight to the target, and, uh, you know, you're not going to have that same tendency of, of trying to hold the pin in a certain spot where your pin locks up below the spot, like sometimes happens with target panic, or at the last second you try to flip the arrow in there with your wrist, you know, because you, you just can't get yourself to time it perfectly and you get this whole nervous condition that, that surrounds that. It's called target panic, and that's why target shooters shoot the surprise release, and I've told you why I do it from a hunting standpoint. It just sort of uh, uh, forces me into the fewest number of steps while I'm shooting, uh, which gives me the greatest opportunity for good shots. So let's take a couple of them here. Uh, this is with an index trigger release. This is the Scott Shark that I was talking about last week. And I've got it really shortened up so I can get to that trigger well into my index finger. And that's important because you, you sort of deaden the sensation of movement the further into the finger you go. I pull pretty hard into the back valley at full draw, the back wall uh, of the bow at full draw, that also tends to deaden a little bit the sense of when it's going to go. Uh, so I, you know, with a little bit of pressure against the back wall and deep into the index finger, uh, I tend to be able to make more of a surprise release or make the surprise release more easily than I would uh, shooting any other way. So I'll take a couple shots here and then uh, I'll talk about my final tip after that. Two things about that shot I liked. One was the bow went straight forward and then tipped. I didn't make any effort to control the bow uh, when it was you know, kicking forward. If the bow would have turned like this or you know, in some other way, if the bow hadn't followed through straight toward the target, I would have been a little bit more nervous about my shot. Uh, that, that can mean a number of things. We can always dig into that stuff later, but you want the bow to jump straight forward and then, and then just relaxed you know, in your hand, it just tips forward. Uh, I circle the grip with my middle finger and my thumb. I don't use a, uh, uh, I can't remember what they're called now, wrist strap or whatever they're called. I used to do that, but it seemed like it, it took time away from getting off a quick shot in the field. We talked about that last week, how important I feel like it is. You know, not to have that wrist sling that you've got to slip into, you know, to slow you down as you're, as you're getting the shot off. I like a quick shot. So today's grips are so small that I can circle that without having to squeeze. These bows with the parallel limbs, they don't really have that much forward kick to begin with. So you can get by without using a wrist sling. Uh, just keep a nice relaxed grip and, and uh, you know, touch your fingers together here. The other thing I liked was when I shot, my hand went straight back and rested on my right shoulder. That's another key for me. I want the bow going straight forward. I want my hand coming straight back. And you can cheat that. You'll see guys do it. They'll pull the trigger and then they'll bring their hand back because they know it's supposed to be back there. But that's not the goal. The goal is that it's all part of the squeezing uh, surprise release motion. You're nice and relaxed. Everything just sort of moves in two different directions. You know, one straight back and one straight forward. All right, one more. I almost shot it out of my hand that time. It just caught it on the end of my finger. But uh, that's, that's the surprise release. Uh, go back and, uh, like I said, I know we've got some episodes where we talked about shooting that Scott Longhorn hex. And we can give you a link to that so you can go back and watch one of those episodes too. Uh, you need to be able to get this type of shot ingrained in your nervous system. If you can't do it with an index 
uh, trigger release because you're so used to commanding it, I really recommend that you switch to a pure back tension release and uh, you know learn to shoot that way. The other tip is a real simple one. If you uh, shoot with bare hands, the the uh, amount of friction between your uh, palm and the grip is going to allow you to control the bow a lot more than you know me shooting with these little jersey gloves. So basically the bow just slips all around in my hand. I don't have a lot of control over the direction that the bow is pointing with my hand. You know, I use, obviously I use my upper body and, and move my you know, upper body up, down, left, right in order to position the pin. And by shooting with these gloves, you eliminate all that bow hand torque and you get a lot more of a pure shot. At first, it's gonna feel kind of strange because you're not used to having so little control over the bow, but uh, in time, uh, you'll, you'll come to where you really like it. It eliminates bow hand torque. And I hunt with these, so I shoot with them during the off season too. So one more shot, and then we're gonna move on. Nice and deep in the index finger, and I'm pulling against the back wall and just squeeze. How you do it. Now I'm out at one of my spots on the farm where I've got a small food plot tucked back in the timber. If you remember back to last fall, uh, I had a new one that I had just started to create. And I sat there a few times. There was nothing planted in it. It was just an opening and I was hoping that that buck I was hunting at that time uh, that I'd nicknamed Lucky would come past and you know maybe make a scrape or you know somehow be uh, drawn to that opening. I created the opening with a chainsaw and uh, with the Cabela's uh, compact tractors and uh, equipment attachments, uh, front end loader. Uh, so really trying to show, uh, you know, we do the poor man plot every year. And I won't call this a rich man plot because, you know, these are you know, fairly affordable uh, tractors and fairly affordable equipment compared to some of the stuff that you can go out and buy. So uh, I want to take you back here again now and go over the spot with a little bit more detail and uh, Take you through the plan of what we're going to do with this now. Uh, the tree stand is right over my left shoulder and this is where I spent the whole season, not the whole season, but the, t the days that I hunted it last season was in that tree and I think I'm going to stick with that one uh, for this coming season. I may get a little bit more aggressive and go back into the plot a little ways, but on any south wind we're on the far downwind end of the plot now. We can sneak in through a little trail through the woods, pop into this uh, tree and then sneak back out again and uh, the plot itself is L-shaped. And I do like an L-shaped plot because sometimes you're gonna have deer on the opposite side of the L that uh, have you know, no concept that you're in there sneaking away. And it sort of it helps to break up the food plot into two pieces and uh, allows you to hunt it maybe a little bit bigger than the actual physical size of the plot. This plot will be no more than a half an acre when we're done, probably even a little bit less than that. So let's take a look at it. Uh, first, let me talk for just a second about this whole concept of these micro plots and they're super super important to my hunting strategy uh, what we found over the years is that the deer have to have something to orient to when they're traveling uh, obviously you can set up on funnels those always work uh, during the early and late season you can set up on food but during the rut another area that seems to do well all day long are these little small openings that you create back in the cover and I like to have food in them because uh, that just gives the does a reason to pop in there mornings and evenings and then that gives the bucks, obviously, if the does are popping in there, it gives the bucks a reason to come and check the spot out too. Any buck that's cruising through this area by this coming fall is gonna pop in and check out this plot. Uh, and that's, that makes for some pretty exciting hunting. Keep them small uh, so that almost everything that comes out stays or comes within bow range and uh, tuck them back in the cover a ways. So that's the, the concept behind it. We're gonna talk more about poor man plots uh, in the coming episodes. These are the ones that you can make with just a little bit of sweat and, and not very much equipment and not very much money. This, this one is not a poor man plot, uh, but it serves a lot of the same purpose. Okay, like I said, this is just an L-shaped plot. And we've already done some work in here. I came in uh, back in, I don't know, maybe early October uh, last year and cleared out a section of it. And it was mostly uh, an area that we'd done a lot of timber stand improvement over the years where there was a lot of trees that were downed and it opened it up and it had grown up real brushy. But having these, like I said, these micro plots back in the timber is really valuable. 
So I decided to give up this one as a bedding area and turn it into one of these more uh, social hubs. So first step was, in, in these situations, is always to come in and cut down whatever trees are there uh, and, and make the plot the correct size and the correct shape. Like I said, you know, between a quarter and a half acre is plenty big enough and an L shape is pretty nice. Uh, locations are important. I like to be up on top of a ridge like we are here. You get down in the valley and you run into that swirling winds like we've been talking about in the past uh, few episodes. So you want to map that out first. Make sure that you're going to be able to get into and out of the spot uh, without bumping into a lot of deer. Make sure that when you're sitting in there, you're going to have some kind of a foolproof wind where you're not going to get picked off by a lot of deer while you're in the stand. So we arrived at this spot and there's plenty of other options around this food plot. It drops off into a steep valley on that side. We could come all the way through and set up on that edge and hunt it on a north wind, come in this direction, or we can stay real conservative and stay on this end uh, where, where we first started and hunt it on a south wind. Uh, so let's kind of walk this one around. Like I said, we came in here with the Cabela's equipment and removed a bunch of uh, the, the sort of dead trees and brush and stuff that we could push out. There's a lot left in this project though if you look at it. There's a lot of stumps, um, there's a lot of rough ground, there's a lot of brush. Uh, we're going to have to get back in here with the equipment. So there's a lot to do yet on here and we'll bring that to you over the next few episodes. But uh, let's take another look at it. It's got a nice uh, sunny exposure here. Sort of lays, you know, where you're going to catch sunlight most of the day. You know, right now I'm facing straight south and the, the morning sun is just laying right in here. Uh, we might have to drop a few more trees on the edge once we get this planted if we're not getting enough sunlight in here. But I think we'll be okay. Then anytime you've got uh, a, a plot that lies east and west, you tend to have a better chance of getting sunlight in there for longer periods of time because obviously the sun is tracking east to west. So you're not going to have you know, the shadows like you're going to have uh, for a better part of the day uh, like you would have on a north-south uh, facing or, or north-south north running food plot. Okay, we're at the corner right here, and uh, I can see a, a few more trees I'm going to take out. You know, maybe this little small shingle oak. There's another shingle oak a little bit further back in there. Uh, I won't take out that big one there. And then we'll kind of wrap in, make a little small end to it there. So I'd say right now I'm standing about 60 yards, roughly maybe 55 to 60 yards away from the tree stand. It's probably another 40 yards or so, uh, 45 yards down to the end of the plot. But the nice thing about it is when you got a plot this small, if a deer pops out on that end, he's probably going to work his way down the, the entire plot. You need, to, you need to get on these things because now is the time. I'm a little bit uh, reluctant to start spraying right now. Uh, that's going to be a step that we're going to use pretty soon on the poor man plot. But you've got to have enough uh, heat during the day that the plants are growing aggressively. In this coming week, it looks like the forecasts are calling for a lot more warmer temperatures. So it might be time to start spraying and killing some of these areas that we're going to put into plots. Uh, the poor man plot really relies a lot on, you know, killing everything that's there and then uh, burning it off, all the residue. But this one here, we got some more dirt work we got to do first, and then we'll go ahead and spray it and get it ready. So keep following us uh, over the next couple of weeks here. This location is critical to any hunting that we do in this part of the farm. And uh, it's a cool spot, like I said, lays up on the ridge, right in that core area where we've been hunting some of these better deer over the past few seasons. So we want to make sure that this is going to be ready for us by fall. Well, that's it for this week. A couple things I wanted to remind you of. Uh, this is prime time for mushroom hunting. Uh, it's also prime time for turkey hunting all over the Midwest. And if you haven't checked it out yet, uh, we've got a couple of websites that we produce. Uh, one is cabelaspringthunder.com, uh, focused on turkey hunting. And we also have one called gobblerwatch.com. And that's a really cool sort of uh, social platform where you can share what the turkeys are doing in your area and post pictures of the ones that you've killed and you know, just kind of get interaction between yourself and other turkey hunters in your area uh, so you can compare notes and figure out what the birds are doing. And that's been real popular, but you know, we can always use more traffic there and, and uh, you know, more interaction from more people. So please check that out. Um, and I guess we'll see you back here again next week. We've got plenty of work to do on the farm. And uh, I'm looking forward to digging into it. You know, it's, it's prime time now for that also. We got uh, warmer temperatures, we got enough uh, growth in the weeds that we can start thinking about killing them and, and really moving on to our fall crops in these small food plots. So uh, I appreciate it, like I said. Uh, thanks for joining us. We'll see you right back here again next week for the next episode of Midwest Whitetail. 
And remember to always dream big.